Welcome to Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing, some were dancing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, and we are starting season eight of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast, because I just told you it was that. But this is exciting because we're we're just rolling along. We're already on the eighth album of the band. Uh, we're looking at 1975 right now. And um, they've already done so much in such a short time of being together. They've been through some lineup changes. They've been through um, just a lot being on the road. And they're still making some pretty amazing music. This song that we're covering today, the title track of Return to Fantasy, is uh, is a song that I love very much. And it is a it's a double shuffle for drummers. If you guys didn't watch the video that I did on uh, shuffles as they relate to your Heap, uh, that is on my YouTube channel. But if you want to watch a much better version of that, there is a, a, a video that Russell Gilbrook did on shuffles that uh, that just, you know, blows the one that I did away. He's very, very good at them. And uh, when it comes to double shuffles, I don't think there's anybody better at explaining them. And there's so many with Uriah Heap. Uh, Easy Living would be another one. And uh, and this one he mentioned when I spoke to him uh, in my interview for the Haskin Cast podcast, Return to Fantasy is also a double shuffle. And uh, they're really just a lot of fun. They, uh, you know, the drums are not hit as hard because you have to hit twice very quickly. So it's not like you're going to have a heavy snare drum attack, but it does move the song very, very quickly. Uh, a very cool thing, a really nice little uh, trick that you can use in songwriting. And uh, it's always good to have an album with a shuffle. Sometimes it's good to start an album with a shuffle like they did here in the song Return to Fantasy. Now, we do have one uh, lineup change. Of course, John Wenton has taken over bass and some vocals for the band and this uh, this is interesting. Now, I knew John Wetton first from uh, Asia because that was the band that I heard first with uh, songs like Heat of the Moment, Only Time Will Tell, with Carl Palmer on drums from Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Um, you know, some some really amazing musicians in that band. But they were playing a lot of straightforward stuff. So it was, it was really interesting and, and um, great songs, but kind of not what you would expect out of that caliber of musician. Not that it's a bad thing, but it just wasn't as technical as you would expect it to be. They were very much an 80s rock band. And uh, but as I grew more as a uh, as a fan of music and as a musician myself, I stumbled across King Crimson. In fact, I had in the court of the Crimson King on eight track. Don't laugh. I know you're laughing. It's all right. Um, and then, uh, of course, had it on LP. I very much remember the very day that I got that album on LP. We went over to Canada from Detroit, where we were uh, living just outside Detroit in a suburb called Mount Clemens. And we went to this mall over there and they had In the Court of the Crimson King on LP, which I was very anxious to get because I hated the eight track version, you know, switching gears in the middle of a song and having it all just chopped up. It was just such a strange format. I get the progression of it. I'm glad we had them, but it's still a very weird format to me. Uh, in any case, especially when you have long songs like in the Court of the Crimson King, it's kind of like, you know, having an eight track with the song Magician's Birthday or Salisbury on it. It's going to get cut in one or two places as it switches tracks to kind of maximize the amount of tape they had to put in it. But in any case, I was very excited to get that LP and very excited to get home and listen to it. And it was in the autumn. And on our way back, uh, we threw a, a, a rod through the engine in our van and we were stuck for a couple of hours uh, just waiting to get uh, towed or whatever was going to happen. I don't really remember all the details of how it worked out. I just remember it was an it was an overcast kind of rainyish day, as was very common that time of year in Michigan. And I could not wait to get home to play in the Court of the Crimson King and finally hear those songs actually straight through and appreciate them to the level they should have been. But the reason I'm even telling the story is because John Wetton was the singer on that album and bass, of course. Uh, just a phenomenal album and uh, very, very progressive. 
and uh, really something that I think kind of, uh, you know, set up a lot of stuff for the kind of bands that we would come to see later, like Emerson, Lake and Palmer and a lot of the technical stuff that uh, that bands did in, in the progressive world. So he has now joined Uriah Heep at this point. And, uh, and it's interesting because, you know, coming in to, to play bass in this band, it had to be kind of really exciting, but kind of intimidating at the same time, just because of the the work that was laid by Paul Newton and Gary Thane uh, for what was going to be expected of a bass player. And even if your writing wasn't in that vein with that kind of progressive bass playing in mind, you still had to play the songs that already existed. So you had to be pretty damn good if you were going to join this band. And of course, you know, they're uh, pretty popular at this point. So you kind of have to be good anyway. But I, I think that as a bass guitarist, this is probably one of the more challenging bands that you could have joined at the time just because of, you know, the style that uh, that this band has, especially when it relates to the bass guitar, as we've heard on so many songs. Now, uh, a quick note about Gary Thane on this album. Uh, the deluxe uh, CD that I have that uh, that I work off of for, for these shows does have two versions of Return to Fantasy. There is an extended version and I think that that is really the only um, the only alter that well, it's not really an alternate version. So there are four tracks that are listed as alternate demo versions, and the liner notes in the CD say that uh, Gary Thane did play on those demo versions, uh, but all of the other stuff would have been um, John Wenton. So uh, for Return to Fantasy and for the extended version that we're going to review today, uh, which there are a couple of differences in the extended version. And we'll get to that uh, after we listen to the song. But that is uh, that is all going to be John Wenton, according to the liner notes in the CD. Uh, this was written, I believe, by Ken Hensley and David Byron. Uh, really fantastic song. Uh, it's, a, it's really a great way to kick off an album with a powerful song like this. Wonderworld had a lot of great songs. I liked all the songs on it, but it was very much up and down for a rock and roll band. As far as the, the content, there wasn't a lot of hard driving rock songs. It was kind of a you know, 50% uh, rock and 50% a little more mellow. So it was uh, it was an interesting album. So to kind of come back with Return to Fantasy and kick off the album with this song, I kind of feel like it's saying, okay, we tried something on Wonder World and now we want to go back to this. We're serious. We're going to be driving again, hard driving music and just sets a great tone for the album. Uh, where the album goes from there, it goes from there. But I just kind of think that um, to set that impression after coming off of an album that um, that was kind of half hard rock and half rock, um, just a, a great way to kind of tell people, here's where we're at right now. And, you know, it's it's always nice to have a little bit of a change of input from time to time. I mean, if you've got a solid lineup and things are working, I never would recommend changing out a member just to freshen things up. That's silly. Why would you do that? But when things happen, you have to move forward. And in this case, uh, it, it is good to have a little bit of a fresh um, impression, a fresh take on things, new ideas coming into the band. And uh, even though John was not a credit as a writer on the song, I mean, certainly all the musicians that play on every song have some kind of influence. It's not like the writer says, here's all the notes you're going to play and the way you're going to play them. You know, they write the song, they know the style of the people that they're playing with. It was probably a little bit of an experiment, um, kind of learning how to work with with John when they first started the writing sessions. But that's how it goes. Um, but I, I can say, honestly, I feel like he really fit in well with the band. Uh, he wasn't in the band for very long, but he he fit in very well. So uh, that's enough about me rambling about things in this album. Uh, I love it. I love the art. So it's not enough. Actually, I'm going to talk about the artwork a little bit. This is... Um, it's a really interesting piece of artwork. I'm not sure I completely understand it. I think the concept is sort of a, a phoenix rising from the ashes, but it's also in the form of a person. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing. For the longest time, I thought it was a rock, but I don't think that's the case. It's just some sort of maybe blurred out uh, fire with uh, with the uh, the heart just being fully alight inside. I'm not sure. Maybe I don't understand the concept of the cover, but that's what I see when I look at it. It's it's sort of a person with wings that are kind of behind them, but kind of in front and to the side of them. You see a couple of bird hands in there. Um, I don't know. Okay, I'm just going to say I don't get the cover, but I do feel it's it's kind of alluding to the phoenix rising from the ashes kind of thing. Um, I don't know what the popularity of Wonder World was back at, at that time, you know, in, in the mid-70s. 
But I've heard a lot of people just say that, you know, it's not that great of an album. It's not my favorite. I don't listen to it that often. But, you know, we just went through every song on that album and every bonus track. And I loved every one of them. You know, it it might not have been a, a cohesive album just because of the, uh, you know, the 50-50 hard rock to to gentler songs. And maybe that's why people feel that way about them. But if you take every song on on as its own, every one of them has a lot of great stuff in it. There wasn't a single thing that I didn't like as far as that goes. And uh, well, if, if you've been with me through all of season seven, then, you, then you've then you already heard all this. So uh, without further ado, let's get to Return to Fantasy from the album Return to Fantasy. Let's talk for a minute about this amazing intro, just stunning, very powerful. Uh, it's they're they're definitely in the the hard rock element, very Uriah Heep ish um, intro. Lots of keyboards. This band has made an incredible amount of use of the theremin, or you know whether it's an actual theremin or whether he's playing it on the Moog. I don't know. Uh, there's still a, a lot of controversy about that. But in any case, the sound that we're hearing is theremin ish. And I've never heard a band utilize that one sound so much and do it so well, reinventing it for every song. Uh, absolutely love it. Sounds fantastic. And, and it being a lead in the intro, uh, it, it just sounds very powerful and kind of uh, mystical and, and creepy. And you kind of wonder, going along the title of Return to Fantasy, are they trying to go back to a Demons and Wizards, a Magician's Birthday kind of feel? Are they saying, look, this is where we were happy and we want to return to that? I don't know. Don't know anything that was behind the scenes on that. But it certainly would, would fit uh, what we're hearing so far. Now, uh, if you were listening to the bass at all, uh, you can really tell that what John Wenton's playing here really fits in well. Um, just uh, a very powerful, works really well with the drums, already a tight rhythm section. And um, let's talk about the drums. They sound fantastic. This is probably one of, if not the best drum sounds I've heard in, in a Uriah Heap recording so far. Everything is in the mix. You can you can hear it. You can feel it. And, uh, and it's fantastic. Usually the toms are a little dulled down. And um, not this time. Everything is just right there, all working very cohesively. The sound is great. And uh, let's let's see where it goes from this powerful opening. Such an everyday look in every way, trying to make a connection to find a piece of the action. Like a hungry boy who doesn't know he is close to perfection. Choice is the question. Moonlight night after moonlight night. Side by side, they will see us right. But if they cared to look, then they would see it's our return to fantasy. Fantasy. Well, from what I can hear, I, I do hear what I think are some guitars in the very, very far background in my left ear. Could definitely use a little more guitar. Uh, it sounds like he's playing something a little more rhythmic. I think that could have boosted uh, the rhythm section a little bit and, and balanced out the keyboards a little more. But uh, overall, I think it sounds good and uh, love what uh, John Wetton's playing through this. Uh, just, just, you know, exactly what you would expect from a, a Uriah Heat bass line. Uh, drums are rock solid through this, some really cool accents that we're hearing from Lee Kerslake. And the vocals, man, you know, right off the bat, just uh, just a solid vocal performance. I really like what he's singing here. I kind of like that he uh, he cut that uh, fantasy note short. 
uh, a little bit. We'll hear it a little longer, I believe, down the line in the song, if I remember right. Uh, but uh, yeah, just just rock solid all around. Just, you know, a little bit more guitar would be nice. But apart from that, it sounds good. The keyboards are nice and strong, really back to uh, just just a powerful, thick sounding song, which is what you uh, what you would come to expect from a band of of this nature. somehow abusing by the person you're using moonlight night after moonlight night side by side they will see us right but if you cared to look then they would see it's just our return Well, I asked for it and I got it. I wanted a little bit more guitar and I could hear more guitar in the second verse. Uh, great groove. Um, I love at the end of that uh, that chorus, though, how he kind of dropped down and was a little more casual saying fantasy. And then the the last one was, a, again, a little bit more powerful, longer sustained note. I like that uh, variety there. It feels really good and um, just, you know, solid playing. I really like the accents, too, that we're getting from Lee Kerslake on the hi-hat there, where, you know, you might be tempted to play a little bit bigger of a drum fill. Those shuffles are tough, man. It's it's hard to play that. This is almost a six-minute song. Now, I know that Lee was a big guy, and he was probably very strong. I know Russell Gilbrook is not a very tall guy, but he's got some guns, and I do not have guns. I have sort of, uh, what, what do you call them, pipe cleaners, I guess? And and for me, you know, it's a very difficult to sustain more than a couple minutes playing a shuffle like this and to do it so smoothly and, and with with that kind of rhythmic perfection is really impressive. I've heard Russell play this, too, and uh, just just very, very powerful drummers that uh, really they're just doing what they should be doing with their lives. Obviously, I mean, they're they're just born to to be drummers and they're both very good at it. And uh, it's it's really cool to hear someone be able to, you know, not have to punch in this kind of stuff or have to patch it up because this is like real live. We just recorded it and you had to be good enough to do it. And and both of those guys are very, very cool stuff. Um, really, I just love the overall sound of the song too. You know, it's, it's just very rich and full. Uh, the keyboards are a little heavier than the guitars still, but, uh, but I feel like it's, uh, it's getting closer to what, what I feel would be a better balance. Um, I, I, I'm glad to be hearing some of the guitars in the mix more now. Um, and again, it's interesting, you know, Mick was not a writer on this song or credit as a writer on this song. And again, he's pushed back a little bit in the mix and the keyboards are pushed a little more forward. Uh, I don't want to say that anything political was happening with that. I don't know. All I know is that that has seemed to be a fairly consistent thing, unless it's just something I'm completely imagining, because that's also very possible. My mind goes where it goes, guys. I'm not responsible for it. I I probably am, though. I want to stop it here real quick for a second because, uh, you know, they've used this effect on the vocals before. I absolutely love it. They don't overuse it at all. It's uh, very tastefully done. Uh, it's it's pretty subtle um, you, uh, amount of use in this song, but where it is used, it's very powerful. So the according to the official lyrics uh, where David Byron is singing time, 
the word that's being sung through that processor is dreaming. So it's time dreaming, time dreaming, uh, kind of goes along with the whole uh, feel of the song, which I really like. Um, the, the the lyrics are very much um, imagery and fantasy oriented. So uh, I, I don't think musically necessarily, uh, but but sto- uh, story wise, I think this would have fit well on um, on Demons and Wizards or, or maybe Magician's Birthday. But it, so it, it's it's kind of like I feel like they're, you know, I'm, I'm a little more confident in my assessment of the return to fantasy concept. We'll see where the rest of the album goes. But at least as far as this song feels like it was kind of the intent of that anyway. Um, but very cool. Anyway, I just wanted to uh, chime in about that effect in the lyrics. a new face like an unfinished painting your creator is waiting the brush and pen describe what it is inside that will set your mind thinking while the others are sinking moonlight night after moonlight night side by side they will see us rise but if they can Nice little change to uh, put that effect on that whole section there of of the vocals. And speaking of the vocals, I want to talk about the backing vocals, because for some reason in this song, they just sound so huge and majestic. I don't know if it's the the particular reverb that they're using that's that's doing it or the way that it's blended in. But there's something about it that makes it just seem uh, so much bigger than uh, than normal. They sound fantastic. And uh, I'm pretty sure uh, when they were saying dreaming, that was the 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 chorus of the band. Um, and then of course it was just David singing time, but very, very powerful, um, very energetic. I love the drum fills, great transitions, uh, everything that you could want in a song, especially one to start an album off. Are you guys like me? Do you kind of feel like you just want to follow wherever that's going? Like you're not really willing to let go of this song yet and you just want to follow it down the down the road it's traveling on as it fades out? I do. I, I definitely want more. And it's amazing because we, we just listened to a song that's uh, just under six minutes long. That's a lot of time. And uh, to, uh, to, to want more of it at that point is a song of a sign of great songwriting, great performances. Um, you know, if I'm right on what I think the guitars are doing, and Mick is playing his ass off on this, that's that's a lot of playing. And it, it's just kind of, you know, pushed to the side and, uh, and, and just really almost felt more than heard. And sometimes you need that. Sometimes not everything needs to be in the foreground. Sometimes you just need things that thicken things up and move things along that are a little outside of, of the main focus or perception. 
But in any case, it, it worked very well. And uh, overall, fantastic song. Uh, I love it. Solid vocals. Great everything, uh, especially the energy. I love the energy on the song. And so uh, I want to I want to talk about the extended version of the song. And uh, there's a little bit extra at the beginning. So I'm going to play that for you and then we'll talk about it. And then there's one uh, one or two other sections that I want to go over with you. So what we have here is we have, uh, you know, the beginning of the song, but somebody decided to basically uh, copy and paste that uh, first few bars to uh, to double the length of the opening before we start hearing that synthesizer come in. But it's not perfect. It's uh, it's just slightly off. So it has a bit of a of an awkward feel in that transition, um, you know, and, and again, if this was done it, back when when the album was first recorded, then certainly this is all magnetic tape cutting and and uh, you know taping together and bouncing it from one thing to another. It's a lot of work, and um, they were not easy things to do back then. I've only had to splice tape a couple of times. It was a nightmare. I do not any anybody that had to do that, and that was a, a very common thing back then when when you know engineers would edit uh, songs down to do radio play versions and things like that. Um, uh, I, I'm glad that I became an engineer, uh, shortly before the, uh, the digital age, I still worked on, on analog for a while. Um, then I, uh, resisted digital for quite some time. And, and once I jumped into it, I'm like, I don't know why I waited so long, but in any case, um, so it's, uh, it's not the, the most perfect edit, but basically all they did was just tack a, a few more bars onto it that are exactly the same as the bars that come after it. So uh, it's not really like an alternate take or anything, which is why, again, it's called an extended version because they're just taking what's there and extending it out. Um, sometimes an extended version is actually like we played a longer version or the uh, the main song that we put on the album, we chopped it down. So the uh, the actual song that they played becomes then an extended version. Um, in this case, uh, for that particular part, it was it was just definitely uh, copying and cutting some magnetic tape. Now, this next little part I'm going to play for you is where the song would be transitioning to that final instrumental section uh, after the vocals are over, leading into the fade out. They did uh, another little bit of an edit here, which, you know, again, knowing the song as well as I know it kind of feels like a bit of an awkward transition. It feels edited to me. But I suppose if you had never heard it before, it probably wouldn't be noticeable. So what they've done here is they've clipped on a copy of the first verse. Uh, it's the same recording, same drum fill, same accent, same bass, everything. They just copied it and pasted it on here to extend the song out a little bit more. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's kind of weird now that I think about it. I mean, we're looking at a song that's almost six minutes. Why would you need to make an extended version of that? I mean, I could see cut, you know, making a shorter version, cutting it down for, you know, maybe a a B-side or a radio play or something like that. But to make a, an extended play version, that sounds more to me like a, like a record company marketing gimmick, um, especially if it's not a new performance, like they didn't add a verse to it or, or anything like that, or, you know, do a different recording of it. Definitely sounds like maybe there was uh, an EP. I don't know if EPs were a thing yet in 75, but uh, it might have been something like that. Or maybe there was like an extended play 45. I don't know what the time limit was on a 45. I, I know it depended on how you cut the groove, but um, certainly there is a maximum length that you could have on a 45. So uh, I'm sure that you could get a seven or eight minute song on a 45 if you really wanted to. I remember having 45s that had uh, two songs on each side. So I would imagine it, it had to be at least seven or eight minutes that you could get. But in any case, uh, this is what we're given is, is this extended cut. And that's really what it is. It's it's a cut. It's just cutting pieces of song and pasting them in different places to uh, make it longer. 
um, kind of weird. This uh, this last part I'll, I'll play is uh, just a little bit longer of an ending uh, as it as it faded out. Um, they did uh, a slower fade from the original. I always wonder too when when songs fade out. How much longer did the band go on and play? Was it ten seconds? Was it a minute? And, and somebody just finally said, "All right, we got we got enough to stop." I don't know. I know that when Roger Glover did some of the uh, the remixes for the Deep Purple twenty uh, fifth anniversary reissues. He actually let those songs go until they stopped. So you got to hear how the band ended the songs, which is kind of neat. If you're a casual listener of a band, you're probably not really going to want to hear that. You're not going to care. It's probably going to take away from the song more than it would add to it. But if you're somebody who's like a diehard fan of the band and you want to hear every note they ever played and you want to hear every phrasing and every word that was uttered during a recording session and all that. Um, then they're real gems, you know, to be able to to hear how things actually ended. But, you know, with a song like this, it's kind of like, it's kind of nice to just let it fade out into the ether, you know, and, and just think that in your head, it never stopped. It just went on forever. And of course, if you hear something that says it didn't, even though you know it didn't, but if you hear something that says that, it's kind of like, it, it ruins that part of the fantasy of the song, I guess. So, you know, it, it's really up to the individual, whether it's something that you would ever be interested in hearing or not. Uh, for me, it depends on the band, I think, or maybe it depends on the particular song. Uh, for a song like this, it's like, are you curious enough to know how the magic trick was done? Or would you prefer to stay in the mind of just believing that magic exists? I don't know. That's how I feel about this song. But this song is, you know, a very, very beautiful song. It's one of my favorites, very personal for me. So I probably tend to err on that. I kind of want to believe that magic exists. And that's just the way it is for me. But if I heard it, I probably wouldn't be upset. So I don't know. Talking out of both sides of my mouth. Here's how it ended in the extended version. So pretty cool. Um, I, I love that the, uh, the, the theremin sound kind of stays a little bit longer. Uh, it, it seems like that fades out a little slower than the rest of the band does. Some great accents from John Wetton, uh, just powerful drums. Uh, just the whole thing, the whole song is is just a, a powerful, powerful song. And uh, I really enjoy it. I'm really glad that they uh, they kicked off the album with this. I think it sets a great tone. But you know what, guys? It's Thursday and we're at the end of the episode. So we're going to have to wait until tomorrow to see what happens with our next song, which is Shady Lady. I do have to say, though, it's it's pretty cool that there are uh, two bonus tracks on the song uh, or on this uh, CD. And then we have, you know, the four alternate versions and then the one extended version. So there's a lot of nice bonus material on this particular um, uh, deluxe edition for Return to Fantasy. And since four of them are labeled as actual alternate versions, I'm expecting something different from them as opposed to this, which is an extended version, which I'm not expecting different material. I'm just expecting, you know, the typical, uh, you know, let's slice it up and reorganize it kind of thing. But uh, overall, yeah, great song. Great episode, guys. Thanks for hanging in there with me. I hope you enjoyed the show. Enjoy your Thursday. It's almost the end of the week for you Monday through Friday, folks. We will see you guys tomorrow for another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. Please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. 
I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy days. <laughs>